Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedoye ola hudi sammyao Namo sadanto suchedoye ola hudi sammyao shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wang jie nan sao yu. 我今见闻得受持愿结如来真实意 Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Sutra Lecture today. It is the 12th of July. Retrograde Mercury officially ends today. Mercury goes direct, hallelujah. And we are here to explore the Flower Garland Sutra, the Abhatamsaka Sutra. And I'm glad that you took some time out of your evening or your afternoon to come and join us. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of us here in Gold Coast of Queensland, Gold Coast Dharma Realm, Buddha Hall, with our beautiful Buddha images here and the ambiance of our, uh, a uh, beautiful winter afternoon. We've had rain recently and the birds are very happy. Uh, today is not as cold as it's been, not as nippy, but uh, it's very comfortable. And... Uh, we are going to be looking into uh, a special section of the text today. We're looking at the Flower Garland Sutra, the Hua Yin Jing, and this section is talking about the uh, 10 stages, and we're on number 10, the 10th stage. We're on the, uh, the peak of the Bodhisattva's accomplishment, this awakened being who's been studying, 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 is now just about to graduate, just about to be, have the same Everything about the Buddha is the same except he's not a Buddha or she's not a Buddha yet. So uh, we're, we're looking particularly at wisdom is the question because this Bodhisattva now, that's, that's the, the criteria of this part of the chapter is wisdom. And the name of it is the Dharma cloud, the stage of the Dharma cloud and uh, cloud of Dharma. And what, is, what do clouds do? They rain, right? Clouds rain down. And... Uh, so this bodhisattva's ability, you could say his mind, you could say his, his nature, his mind, is now able to hold all the rain, just the way the ocean can hold all the water, right? His, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. The bodhisattva's mind is able to hold all the dharma the way the ocean is able to hold all the rain, and that's, that's what we're talking about today. So, Okay, uh, let's see. We now have to uh, request the presence of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. When we're done with that, we're gonna come back to page 32 in our text. And we slide up to the top here, because this is a, um, a formal way to make a, 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 a request, an invocation. We uh, invite the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and the, uh, they say, Tian Long Babu, the gods and the dragons and the Eightfold Pantheon, the spiritual beings, to come as well. To say, uh, we're willing to use the old ways. These are the old ways of doing it, but modernized to, to a new language, for example. And also, uh, we, we put it to a tune that is... Um, <laughs> our tune we put it to a stringed instrument uh, to a guitar in this case and uh, that helps us uh, 
uh, helps us send the, the sounds of the inv invitation out further. We can do it together. Okay, you ready? Let's, let's make our request. Nam mô ta phang quang phu hoang sings beautifully. So back to page 32. Uh, today is something very special. Um, we've had in the 10th stage here, there we go. We're on the bottom of page 32, the last paragraph. Um, as we've been going through the 10th the, uh, stage, um, we've been bouncing back and forth between uh, narration, you know, the story as it goes on, and, and uh, it's uh, the speaker is a bodhisattva whose name is Vajra Treasury, Treasury of Vajra, this uh, kind of diamond-like substance. And he's having a conversation with another bodhisattva whose name is Moon of Liberation, Liberation Moon Bodhisattva. And this has been going on for quite a while. We're at number 10 out of 10. So they're old friends. And surrounding them in, in the story is uh, a, an audience of other bodhisattvas as well as Buddhas, as well as uh, gods from various heavens and uh, dragons, they say. Right? And then all the other spiritual beings. And we're assuming that there will be you know, humans lesser kings, minor kings, and their consorts and their children, and probably there are some peanut vendors, right? You know the story of if you go to the baseball park in America and, and the popcorn guy comes around and he's got, he's got a tray. What does he say? He holds up a paper cone. He goes, who needs popcorn? Who needs popcorn? And the the cultivator goes, yeah, good question. Who needs popcorn? So, never mind. So here they are. The whole audience is out there, you know, waiting to hear the 10th the stage Dharma. And uh, while all the Buddha sutras are spoken by Ananda, who remembers the Buddha teaching them, right? In this case, the speaker is not the Buddha. It's bodhisattvas. The Buddha has blessed them, has given them what they need to, uh, the, the wisdom to be able to experience this Dharma in their nature. But the voices that we're, we're investigating, the, the storytellers here are bodhisattvas, right? Vajra treasury, moon of liberation, and, and all of us who are like hanging on, waiting to hear the story. Uh, today, uh, Dharma Master Hung Lai uh, was invited by the, uh, the uh, community started at Dharma Realm Buddhist University, the community for carrying forward the, the stories of Master Shren Hua. What's, what's the official name? Venerable, Legacy Club. Venerable Master's Legacy Club. Jeez, when I was in school, we had bowling clubs, you know, and we had, we had a, you know, adventurers club. We got Master Hua's Legacy Club. Not bad, not bad. So, Dharma Realm Buddhist University, hubba hubba. 
So um, Master Hung Lai, Dr. Master Hung Lai was, was telling stories, and he said something that really struck me. He said, uh, the question was about uh, what dharmas to practice, what dharma practices are good, and uh, how do you pick one out, how do you uh, stick with one, you know, can you, can you cultivate more than one dharma door, you know, that's our language. And uh, Dharma Master Lai was really telling it the way Master Hua said it, you know, it was right on. He was saying uh, that fundamentally there was no school, there was no teaching, there, there was no Buddhism, you know, the way Master Hua taught, there was only practice uh, to purify your nature, to bring you closer to the Buddha mind, to your own Buddha mind. So at the same time, there are five schools, at the same time you cultivate this Dharma door. And he said some people like, some people are more uh, academically minded, they're more, they like to read, they like to analyze. Those are people who love the sutras. And then he said, you know, the sutras are kind of like a symphony. And he said, you, you tune your ear to be able to hear the music of the symphony because the sutras got everything in it. He says, they're kind of like bodhisattva songs, he said. It's like, yeah, right on. And it was like, uh-huh, yeah, that's, that's really it. They're bodhisattva songs. So we're listening to a particularly profound bodhisattva song here. And uh, so in the 10th stage, there was narration, first of all, Deva women sang to the Buddha, praised the Buddha, giving him their uh, uh, impressions of how, how profound and compassionate he was and how much they appreciated him. Then uh, Bodhisattva appeared and a lotus appeared and lights appeared and, and the word went out that the 10th stage Dharma was about to be explained. So there was all this wonderful stuff that happened. And there was an anointing on the crown and a, a Bodhisattva was promoted to, quote, the rank, ready to, to be part of the, the, uh, those who are qualified to, you know, speak the Buddha's Dharma with the Buddha's voice. And uh, just amazing stuff. And uh, so then once uh, the, all the preparation was in place and everybody was ready to hear the, this 10th stage Dharma, we got 72 items in a row. Uh, the Avatamsaka is famous for 74, I guess. 74, 76. The, the uh, Kalpa uh, list of 10 was more than 10, which is rare. The Avatamsaka is always full of 10 of this, 10 of that, called the teaching of totality. And so there was all kinds of wisdom. And we describe it as kind of the Bodhisattva sitting in the, the pilot's seat of a of a jetliner and seeing all the instrumentation spread out on all sides and levers and, and uh, switches to flip and meters to read and lights to calibrate and, and uh, so there's 70 of them and we got list after list. So um, that's a difficult part of the text to explain because it's, you know, it's fairly dry going to go through from one to 74, 76, however many. And so that's, that's what we just finished at last week. And the Bodhisattva's uh, the conclusion was that this Bodhisattva has all this uh, ability now, all this wisdom is innate in him and then activated. The, in, the in, innate inherent qualities are now fired up, ready to go, like software on your computer, booted up, ready to use. And uh, like all of these wisdoms, so came liberations, samadhis, dharanis, and psychic powers. So all of these qualities are there, present now, and ready, you know, available to the bodhisattva pilot who's going to take his great vehicle, his great airplane, through the skies of living beings to help us wake up. So that's, that's where we are. And uh, the, um, there's a special thing that's going to happen now. We're getting to the name of this stage, the 10th stage. Why is it called Dharma Cloud? All right, here we are. 
Now, here's our paragraph. Okay, that's where we are. Okay, I'm going to re- put my palms together and read that part. And uh, read along with me if you like. Got it? What do you say? What do you say? Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva Mahasattva, having understood wisdom such as this, accords with limitless Bodhi and accomplishes the power of mindfulness and expedient skills. All right. First of all, uh, having understood all this wisdom, he, Sui Shun, Buliang Puti. What is according with limitless Bodhi? What is that? Well, Here's what I do with that. And there's probably many, 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 many ways to describe uh, limitless bodhi and according with it. My way of understanding it today means um, we, we went through a period a couple years back where the text that we were focusing on a lot was called the Bodhi Resolve Essay. It was called the, the Exhortation to Make the Bodhi Resolve. And it's a wonderful text uh, by an a early Qing Dynasty monk, 1800s. And his name was uh, Xing'an Guoshi, Xing'an Dashi, Master Xing'an. And in this, he broke it down. He said, the Bodhi Resolve has eight kinds and ten reasons for coming up. And you should make the Bodhi resolve. Okay, so, hmm. Um, to sum it up, uh, of those ten reasons that the Bodhi resolve comes forth, uh, five of them had to do with remembering people's kindness to me. Keeping in mind all the good things that have happened to me in my life from others particularly gifts that have been given to me. That, that's it. Gratitude is the main reason for the Bodhi Resolve, which does what? Puts it in the heart. Right? It's not a head trip. This is not intellectual. It's like, oh yeah, mm, they were really kind to me. They, um, those folks, starting with the Buddha, and your parents, and your teachers, and then your living beings, and then donors, because he's talking a lot to monks and nuns, people who make your life possible by constant generosity and providing for every need that you have. So with that in mind, what it does to you, set, this is the idea of the essay, is it, it makes you grateful. It opens your heart, softens you up. And there's an idea behind this that spontaneously what you want to do when you know that people have been good to you is you want to pay it back. You want to, you know, reciprocate, keep it moving. Keep her moving. And so what do you do is you, with that open, softened mind and that sense of connection, what the, how the Bodhi Resolve works, and this is, this, is my new, this is why I'm introducing this this way, to accord with limitless Bodhi, says the Sutra. What does that mean? To me, it means two things. One, an ultimate goal and an immediate application. So both theory and practice, right? What's the ultimate goal is wisdom. Bodhi, <coughs> to me, I'm, I'm working off a traditional Chinese interpretation and the traditional Chinese interpretation of Bodhi resolve, known to many as Bodhicitta, Bodhicitta in Sanskrit. Two things. One, you say shang cheng fu dao, and then you say xia hua zhong zheng. And for years, shang means up, xia means down. Shang, up, accomplish Buddhahood. So you go, Buddha's up there somewhere, right? Far away, just like God, right? And living beings are somewhere down there. Uh, How far, you know? And the new awareness, and why I'm bringing this up is, that's a mistaken interpretation to my mind. That ain't the way it is. It's not that the Bodhi Resolve wants you to separate 
the Buddha from living beings, and they're both far away from you. Not. It's not distance. It's time, right? It's not space. It's time. What is Shang, Cheng Fo Dao, means ultimately my highest goal when I make the Bodhi resolve, the way I'm according with limitless Bodhi, is I keep in mind that wisdom is the goal and that I'm not there yet. Wisdom is the goal. And what is wisdom? What does that mean to me? It means you see past the surface. You get to the heart of it, right? Something comes up, you're not confused by the sounds, the, the, the problems, the dust, you know, the grit. You go right past that to the heart of it and keep that in mind. That's what wisdom can do. Wisdom sees the root and the branch. Wisdom looks at the branch tip and knows there's a root, right? You look at the root and you recognize that that's going to produce limitless branch tips. Suppose we were a doctor and if the patient goes, ow, you, don't, you stop the treatment. Doctors can't do that, right? A test, COVID tests are really uncomfortable, man. COVID-19 tests, they take this long, flexible thing. <laughs> oh, God. Luckily, it's flexible, you know. And they've got to get in there to the back of the throat. They have, it has to go back here somewhere to, to figure out if you've got those, if your body is reacting to the presence of the, the, the virus. And if to get, how, you, how else are you going to get a sample of what's in the back of a person's throat, this device, this body, right? You've got to probe back there. If the doctors said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I won't do the test because it's uncomfortable, he wouldn't get past the surface, and we wouldn't know if you're sick or not. And you better know. Sooner the better. Right? So, wisdom looks past the surface. Doesn't, doesn't only work with the, you know. Uh, sometimes the surface is confusing. This morning I was sitting on my deck, and actually Alex and I were both there, and the, uh, the parrots and the lorikeets came at the same moment. And two species of parrots, one a bigger parrot, a smaller parrot, and the smaller parrots are pugnacious. They, they, the first thing they do when they land on or a place where there's food is make sure they're the only ones allowed there and your mate is possible. You have a mate, you have a partner, the two of you are, are as soon as number three comes, first job is to get rid of them, you know, forget the food, rah, attack them, you know, whack. You know. And that's what we've learned about lorikeets and they will knock turkeys out of the way, birds that are 40 times bigger than they are. They'll attack them to get rid of that bird unless they're eating on the deck. For some reason, if you spread some bird seed on the deck or whatever they're eating, they are fine. And today under my feet I had 15 lorikeets and four parrots under my feet, all feeding together in harmony. And I'm like, omi tofu, omi tofu, omi tofu, omi tofu, don't fight. They're like, you know. Why? So sometimes you can't get past the surface. You know, what's going on here? Why is the floor different than the freeder? I don't know what it is. But that's peaceful land. So put it on the floor and they're at peace. So anyway, that's half of the Bodhi resolve, right? Is the Shang Chang Fo Dao. Ultimately, my goal is to have wisdom and I don't forget that. But the second part is where you, where you also apply mindfulness, which is what? Immediately, the way I get to that goal is to hua zhong sheng, is to teach living beings. What does that mean? It means change my bad habits, basically. Living beings of my nature are the greedy ones, the selfish ones, the angry ones, the jealous ones, you know, the ones that forget that we're all connected and try to get the good part for myself. The frightened ones, right? Those are living beings of your nature, the ones that are afraid, and you have to calm them down before they are willing to do something better and different and change. Right? Ooh, you know, whatever we're taught when we're kids stays with us the longest. So uh, that's the Bodhi resolve. It's got two parts. Ultimately, wisdom is my goal. Immediately, I get there by transforming my fear, you know teaching those living beings. So that's the bodhi that this bodhisattva accords with. Now, what does it mean limitless bodhi and according with it? It means that this bodhisattva is learning all this wisdom and 
you know, inventorying all the, the meters and switches and levers in his cockpit because he's going to go fly his plane. But he knows he never forgets why he's doing it or she. It's always clear that it's not so you can be famous. It's not so you can be powerful. It's not so you can be the best. It's for service to others. That's why. So, okay, got it? That's, that's what it means to me to say accords with limitless bodhi and accomplishes the power of mindfulness and expedient skills. That sounds like corporate language, doesn't it? Accomplishes, we will accomplish the power of mindfulness and expedient skill. I don't think the sutras work with, with corporate kind of contract language. What does it mean? Here's, uh, I, I will ask you to tell me. Here it is. Look at this phrase here. I've got it on my screen. I've got Cheng Jiu Shan Qiao Nian Li. Okay, brought up my. It's called uh, Ten Stage Notes. Okay. Uh, oh, I didn't give this to you. So sorry. You just have to. So, Cheng Jiu accomplishes. What does it mean? It means this Bodhisattva has been this, the student has been working with this stuff long enough that he's now got it, master. You think of somebody who teaches sailing, you know. How many separate skills are required to safely take a craft out on the water, travel around, especially if it's a sailing boat, and then bring it back safely without incident and do it well? So many skills. You have to understand physics, right? The water, the air, the rope, the sail, the hull. Your strength, the timing, the, you have to know the weather. So the wind is still, the wind is gale force, you know, time to head back. All these different skills to get to the mastery, where you are confident you can safely take people out, right? So this bodhisattva has now been working with the dharma. That's, that's the sailing he's doing. He's on the dharma boat, right? And he, Chengzhou, masters what? First word, shan. And in other translations of this, I've read, people go right by this, and I think it's really, really, really important based on what we got from our teacher, Master Shen What is shan? Wholesome. Good, right? Capital G, good. And you could even say harmless, for sure. It's harmless. Wholesome, meaning all the things that the Bodhisattva uses when he or she is here teaching are based in goodness. They're harmless. They don't hurt. They don't scare. They don't intimidate. They don't bully. Right? They don't sneak. They don't scheme. They don't connive to get an advantage. They're not two-faced. They're wholesome. They're good. They're kind of like grandparents. The way you respond to to, to good people who are just there to make you feel well and welcome. So, all of the things that this Bodhisattva does in his or her teaching are wholesome. They're good. They're based in goodness. That's the foundation of it. They're not based in smarts, right? If you can show me a way to be both smart and good at the same time, I will follow, right? That's what we want. And then, what's the next word? Chao. So, Cheng Zhou, Shan Chao. Chao, this word, we translate it as clever. Yeah, clever can mean, you know, sneaky. Clever can mean advantages. You know, zi 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 li, getting your own benefit. Clever, the Chao here is better translated as flexible. I really like flexible, wholesome, flexible. What is flexible? It can bend, right? What is flexible? Here's a, this cable is flexible. Here's a flexible cable, right? And it turns, you can turn it into a knot. You can wrap it up, you can make it small, you can make it stretch it out and make it big, you know? Flexible. This Bodhisattva's teaching to living beings, my teaching, when I, if I want to succeed in Hua Zhongsheng, teaching my living beings so I can gain wisdom, I have to be flexible. If I'm stiff, if I'm rigid, if I'm forceful, 
if I'm absolutely certain and stiff, nobody wants it. Right? You can't respond. Once you're, what is, you know, that's what our beloved teacher of Tai Chi and Qi Gong and Shaolin and Xing Yi and Bagua, Master Jiang, Jiang Yunzhong, you know, the late founder of the Wenwu School uh, in, in the East Bay, he said, uh, he, he always said that the waist rotations and the hip circles, those are the two first basic warm-ups for our, uh, our style of our school of Tai Chi, is Guangping Yang School of Tai Chi. He said uh, these two exercises, one is feet together and hip rotations, and then the one is feet apart and waist circles, two directions. He said these are the most important of all because they keep us, our main joints, flexible. I'm tapping my, my hips, or my waist. That's, that's a big joint, right? Waist. And then knees, and then ankles, and then elbows, and then wrists. So he said, as soon as that stiffens up, you're old. And when it gets really stiff, you're dead. Right? So what is youth and vitality? Flexibility. So, stay flexible. So, shan qiao, flexible, means can bend, right? Can really bend. I have a, uh, uh, as a guitar player, I have a deficit, I have a drawback, which is I can't make, I can't, this, this joint, the, the, I guess it's the tip joint of my fingers, I, I'm not able to bend them that way, the way several of my, many of my, advanced colleagues can, to be able to put down on the fret and make it, you know, fret, unable to bend that finger to cover more than one string. I, I can do a little normal, but I can't, I have people who, teachers who are able to bend that back and able to make a chord, I have to use my fingertips. So there's, that's a skill. I'm, I'm insufficiently flexible in my first joint. And if I had that ability, you know, I'd be a better guitar player. So wholesome and flexible. What's the next word? Nian. What is that word? Mindful. Right? Mindful. And mindful, that's our new power word. By golly. If you had, uh, if, if mindful was a stock and you had bought many shares of it 10 years ago, you would be wealthy now, because mindfulness covers the world the way 10 years ago didn't. Nope. Mindfulness now is synonymous with meditation. Everybody wants it. We all want mindfulness, right? Mindfulness at work, mindfulness raising kids, mindful in tennis, you know. So, uh, Another translator of this passage, a uh, fellow monk, monk brother of ours, translated this as memory. Interesting, memory, to remember. Uh, so it does. I like mindful is a very happy word because why? It means your mind is full of. You can keep it in mind. You don't forget it. You don't lose it. You don't, it doesn't, uh, you're not distracted as you're not, uh, bored and let it go, right? Your f mind is full of. Um, so, what do we say? Keep in mind. Keep it in mind, right? Wholehearted. Ah, there we go. Wholeheartedly, right? Yeah, mindful. Same. So, what's the last word that our bodhisattva is? Uh, this is kind of the summary word. How did it go? Go back here. This accords with limitless bodhi and accomplishes the power of mindfulness and expedient skill. All this wisdom, yeah. The last word is li, strength. So, accomplishes, masters, wholesome, flexible, mindful strength. Could Chinese is so uh, malleable and this one, the grammar is very flexible, indeed. Uh, so you could say the strength of wholesome, flexible mindfulness would also work. You could say, how do we go? We said uh, the power 
of mindfulness and expedient skills, mm, probably would translate it differently now. So that's why I, I broke this down word by word for us so we can take a look and see what's, what's available. Master's wholesome, flexible strength of mindfulness. It's good, it's adaptable, and it is based on keeping in mind the goal of the Bodhi Resolve. So far, so good. How are we doing? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, moving on. As they say in Wisconsin, keep her moving. Okay, uh, let's see here. We're going to read down. That's a long passage. We want to read down to no other place can do so. Wei Chu Da Hai Yu Yi Chi Chu Jie Bu Neng. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Cannot. Let's see here. Hold on. Cannot do so. Okay. Receive. Da 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 da. Receive again. Other. Okay. Bu Neng Chi Ru Lai Bi Mi. Okay. Yeah. So I'll go down to Bu Neng Chi down there. All right, ready? Next passage. Here we go. Shi fang wu liang zhu fu, suo you wu liang da fa ming da fa zhao da fa yu. Yu yi nian qing, jie neng an neng shou. No, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. Jie neng an neng shou, neng she, neng chi, pi yu suo jie luo long wang, so shu da yu wei chu da hai yu yi che chu jie bu neng an bu neng shou bu neng she bu neng chi got it ready in a single instant of thought he is able to accept to receive to gather in and sustain all of the limitless great dharma clarity great dharma illumination and great dharma reign of limitlessly many Buddhas throughout the Ten Directions. When the Dragon King Sagara rains down great torrents of rain, only the ocean can accept it all, receive it all, gather it all in, and hold it all. No other places can do so. Okay, now, what is this? This is not a list of ten kinds of wisdom. We're into new territory here. Look at what we got. But suddenly, there's uh, an image. This is a metaphor. And here's what I, in my preface to this today, I said that the name of the, the stage is called the Dharma Cloud, right? Fa Yu Di. And the, it's Fa Yu, Dharma Cloud. Dharma is not rain, it's not wet. There's no liquid in Dharma, right? But in the metaphor, it is. So like this bodhisattva on this stage, his mind can hold a lot of dharma. The ocean can hold a lot of water. Okay, here we go. No amount of rain can overflow the ocean banks. No amount of dharma can f overflow the bodhisattva's mind. And somebody says, yeah, but what about Noah and the ark? Okay, well, yeah. So, the Dharma ark, right? So, that, the water, the rain overflowed the ocean there. It just took over the land. Uh, we won't go there. We're not going to argue that one out. So, there are millennial floods, indeed. Um, however, for the sake of the analogy, let's say lots of rain the ocean pretty much stays in its, stays, the, the land that rises out of the ocean or that surrounds the oceans pretty much doesn't move. The ocean doesn't overflow no matter how much rain falls. Likewise, in a single instant of thought, what does it say? Shi fang si yu yi nian qing, right? So here's a question. How brief is a single instant of thought? Okay, quick. The turning of a thought. Two weeks ago we talked about, uh, or three weeks ago, we talked about how many births and deaths occur in the time of a single thought. And it was 8,000, did we come up with? What was that? I think, uh, 
we had a we had some research on that one. Uh, I think Iwan gave us the the number of births and deaths that happen in a thought instant: eight thousand, eighty thousand, Bawan Sujin, eighty-four thousand. In a single instant of thought, this bodhisattva can do four things. It says he can. Uh, okay. Jianang An can calm, literally, but it means can take in, show, can receive, shu, gather together, hold them all, shi, and sustain it, keep them without falling away, without losing them, right? So, in a single instant of thought, the bodhisattva can do these four things. An, shou, shu, shi. He can, there's, there's hands all over these words, lots of hands. He can get his hands on it. Hold on to, da fa ming, da fa zhao. It says, what is that? Illumination by the Dharma. Now, when I hear this, it's interesting. The, um, what comes to mind, interestingly, is um, the Kabbalah. <laughs> the Kabbalah uh, taught from the Zohar by my beloved teacher, Danny Matt, uh, teacher of Hebrew studies. Um, the, the presence of this teaching has light in itself. The, and it, as it manifests in alphabets, there are light, lighted vessels, light-filled vessels. And where does this cross over to, this image popped into my mind, because um, that is how the Buddha describes my nature, your nature, living beings' nature, mosquito, whales, kookaburras, koalas, the nature of even not don't do politics. I wasn't going to go there. I won't make that joke. So, living beings have light. We have light in our natures, and we are light-filled vessels that we cover up with our attachments and our ignorance, right? our greed. So, when the bodhisattva receives this dharma from the Buddhas here in the tenth stage, there is illumination. There is da fa ming da fa jiao. Big light is shed by this taking in of the 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 wisdom. Okay. Um, here's an example. Uh, we love the stories of koans. The Japanese call them koans. The Chinese call them gungan. What is a gungan? It's a story, basically. Literally, public record, we say, meaning a story. It's accessible to us. What, it, what are the stories about? It's a story about how somebody heard one word from a teacher or one sentence and woke up. It's not always a word. Sometimes the awakening is wordless, right? Sometimes they get hit with a, with a stick. Oh. Teacher knocks, whacks him over the head. Oh, my goodness. You know? Sometimes the teacher will do something outrageous, like jump up and hang from a tree limb. You know? oh, like that. And the disciple sees it, oh, wakes up. Uh, sometimes take a drink of tea, and the, the taste of the water, the temperature of the water, the strength of the tea, the, bodhis, the, awake, the, the uh, person who's being, whose story is being told goes, one sip, ah, you know, awake. Uh, sometimes it's super dramatic. The teacher dies and then comes back to life. <laughs> the, the monk who I just mentioned, Xing'an Dashi, who did, wrote the Bodhi Resolve, that happened to him. That was his story. He died, and they were doing his funeral pyre. He was all laid out, all ready to go. <laughs> and they were, you know, sobbing, wailing. He sits up, <laughs> he looks at him, you know, and he says... Uh, Recite the Buddha's name, that's important. Go to the Pure Land. Falls down, dies again, second time. So, sometimes it's really dramatic, but those teachings, what do they do? They, you could say, bring light. And what is awakening? What's enlightenment? Darkness goes away. 
Where's the darkness? Covering us. That's our theory, right? That we're awake but for the covering of ignorance in our, in our minds. So bringing light in with one word, one story, one example, one shocking return from the dead, you know, boom, the light shines and we see it, we wake up. So here in, actually, interestingly, here in the sutra, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of imagery about light and darkness. Uh, our Avatamsaka has lots of stories about light. And that's, that was interesting because the Kabbalah and the, the Zohar in particular talks in detail about uh, the, the sephirot, the, the uh, vessels of light that unfortunately get broken and shattered and cultivation is to gather up all the sparks, bring them back to purity. So there's an interesting, interesting ancient wisdom crossover between uh, the mystics of the Hebrew tradition and, uh, and Buddhism. So, okay, our bodhisattva gets all this limitless dharma light, the clarity and the illumination and the reign of limitlessly many Buddhas throughout ten directions. Dharma reign, fa yu. Okay, there's our image, dharma reign, fa yu, fa yun, clouds, rain comes out of the clouds. Now, look at this next paragraph, everybody. We have hit another interesting point. We had a really interesting point when we were looking at the uh, anointing of the crown, the consecration. And we talked about how every culture, seemingly ancient cultures around the world, have something to do with this putting of water and oil on the crown of the head of someone who is shifting status, who's going to be appointed, anointed, um, deputized, confirmed into this new status. We talked about that a lot. We had lots of stories and pictures and, and all. Now we've got another one, which is what? When the dragon king, Sagara, rains down great torrents of rain, only the ocean can accept it all receive it all, gather it all in, and hold it all. No other places can do so. Okay. So, the, there's more here to, uh, actually, you know what, we should finish the paragraph. I'm gonna do three more lines here. Okay, we're just to get the whole piece in, all right? Okay, we're going to start with Rulai Bi Mi Zang. Here we go. Rulai Mi Mi Zang Da Fa Ming Da Fa Zhao Da Fa Yu Yi Fu Ru Shi Wei Chu Di Shi Di Pu Sa Yu Yi Che Zhong Sheng Sheng Wen Du Jue Na Zhi Di Jiu Di Pu Sa Che Bu Neng An Bu Neng Shou Bu Neng She Bu Neng Shi Okay, here we are. The great Dharma clarity, the great Dharma illuminations, and great Dharma reign from the Tathagata's secret treasury are the same. Only the Bodhisattva on the tenth stage can accept it all, receive it all, gather it all in, and hold it all. No other sentient beings, be they voice hearers or Pratyeka Buddhas, up to and including Bodhisattvas of the ninth stage, can do so. Got. <clears throat> okay. So. The, the gist of our text says our bodhisattva has now come to the 10th stage and something is now accessible to him that he didn't have access to before, which is what? Dharma teachings. He can now, what are Dharma teachings in this case? You could say the, the instructions of the universe, right? These are the operating instructions for the universe. This is how things work in the big, in the vast, in the in infinite. This is the blueprint of the universe. And the Bodhisattva has now got his, his mind on it. He is mindful of it. It's now accessible to him and he can handle it to the benefit of others. Wholesome, skillful, mindful strength with wholesome, skillful, mindful strength. Now, okay, here's the interesting part. In our image, it said, when the dragon king, Sagara, rains down great torrents of rain, 
Only the ocean can accept it all. Okay. Question for us, for all of you out there in YouTube land, in Zoom land, here in the Gold Coast, everywhere you're who are listening in. What about the dragons? What about Sagara and others? Does that work for you? Does that cut any ice? You know that image, the cut ice, that cut ice, you don't cut ice for me? Does that make sense to you? How do you react when you hear dragons? Right? It's like, hmm? Some, some of us just kind of nod. Yeah, well, that's just what the sutras are. What is you, know, you have to kind of humor them. You know, we, we patronize the sutra. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, yeah. Dharma stuff. Yeah. I, I probably did that at one point in my approach to the Buddhist teachings. But, my goodness, the more you read, the more dragons pop up. The more you read, the more dragons appear in the sutras. They're really everywhere in the Buddha's teaching. And so another approach, this is and the one that I'm going to suggest is helpful, is to consider what these what the sutra wants us to understand about about the Buddha Dharma. The the sutras take the dragons as real. Right? No doubt about it. They wouldn't, it's not just a, an image, right? These dragons are completely part of the sutra. They're as absolutely as real as my buddy here. Don't doubt it for a minute. Right? This is a very skillful, clever dragon. I've made offerings to countless Buddhas in the past. Still doing it, right? So dragons, they got wings, they have tails, they have, what else have they got? Tongues that work, right? So we'll hear more for, from you later, thanks. So just the way this dragon is happily resting on our bench here, taking a nap. Likewise, the sutra presents dragons as completely real. Not only to the sutras to it, but pretty much every culture in the world gives us dragons, some form or another. How interesting. St. George and the dragon is the first one that always comes to mind from people who were raised in a Western literature tradition. Um, what are they called? They're called Nagas in India. And we learn, for example, there were eight of them. Dragons are described as snake-like but spirit beings. They're, they belong to the animal realm, they belong to the spirit realm. They have animals' bodies, but there, mm, there are many, many, many stories about how dragons are their living beings uh, and kind of naughty living beings often because they, they have psychic powers, but they don't have the precepts. <laughs> Trouble can result, you know, mischief can result. They control the rain. Dragons control the rain. Here it said, you know, the way Sagara, the dragon king, can make it rain, so too, you know, there's the Bodhisattva. They were present when the Buddha was born. Dragons bathed the Buddha. Seven of them, nine of them, we say, bade the Buddha when he and he took seven steps and said, "Tian shang, tian xia, wei wo du zun." You know, I am honored, uniquely, among, between heaven and earth. Our sutra, our Avatamsaka sutra, the arrival of the sutra among humans, has in the traditional story has something to do with the dragons, that when the Buddha spoke the Avatamsaka, he knew that people were not going to be ready to absorb it, so he sent it to the Dragon Palace library, they say. And there's even stories about how many volumes there were. There were three different versions of it. And that Nagarjuna, Bodhisattva Lung Shu, Dragon Tree Bodhisattva, um, went down to the palace of the Dragon King and brought back 
the smaller version, the smallest of three. So you hear those and you go, hmm, 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 you know, and that's tradition. That's, that's it's not. What if, what if Nagarjuna went to the Dragon Palace and brought the sutra back? Doesn't hurt the story any. Doesn't hurt our understanding of it. We, you know. So, our teacher, there are, there is a story about Master Shenhua. Um, when he was cultivating that dragons, two dragons in particular, came to him and asked for refuge. One's name was Ji Xiu, one's name was Kuai Du. And Shifu gave them conditions whereby he would accept them. He, I, I won't try to tell the story, that's not my story to tell, but uh, it is definitely part of our teacher's heritage that he has two dragon disciples at least whom he named, right? And who, who came to him. They are his Dharma protectors. And there are people in Shifu's long story, long lineage of teaching, who have encountered those particular dragons who have come, you know, they, they, do, they work for Shifu. They're his agents in some cases. Okay, um, what else? Maitreya Bodhisattva, when Maitreya Bodhisattva becomes a Buddha, is coming back to the Longhua Fa Hui, right? His Dharma assembly will be called the Dragon Flower Assembly. Dragon Flower. So it's like, wow, everywhere you look, when we Qing Fa, when we request Dharma, as we just did, they say, uh, that we are asking the Tian Long Babu, the gods, the dragons, and the Eightfold Pantheon, to attend our assembly, please, and to protect it and to guide us, to give us invisible spiritual strength, you know, so that the things we do here will be in accord with Dharma. So once you start looking, my goodness, there are dragons everywhere. Look at this. I, I did some research today. I've got the Ba Da Long Wang. Uh, there are lists upon lists of the actual dragon kings. There are said to be eight of them. The first is Dharani Dara, whose name is Chidi Luang, earth sustainer. Sustains the earth. Hmm. And in Buddhism, they talk about earth traveling dragons, sky traveling dragons, water, ocean traveling dragons, and space traveling dragons four different categories. Uh, fire dragons, I think, belong, maybe they're all fire dragons. So, next is Huan Xi, Jin Xi, Long Wang. Nanda, sometimes called Upananda, happiness, dragon king, right? There's also Ma Lo, Long Wang, horse and mule, dragon king, from the appearance, Ashvatara, right? So, Dharani Dara, Nanda Upananda, Ashvatara, Long Wang. There is also Mu Zhi Lin To Long Wang, Mu Linda, also called Mu Mu so Mu Linda and Mu Cha Linda, uh, which translates as liberator, right? Or liberated, either liberated by or one who liberates, right? This is one of the powerful dragon kings. There is also Yi Meng Long Wang. Manasvim, fierce intention or fierce ideas, right? Strong, strong arguer. Don't don't get in a debate with Manasvim because his ideas are held strongly, fiercely. Chi Guo Long Wang, Dhritarashtra, sustaining the nation. That's one of the na the four kings of heaven is also Dhritarashtra, right? So he sustains the nation. These king, these dragons work. They have jobs to do. They're servants. They're in service. So, Mahakala, Da He Longwang, big black obsidian, right? Beautiful uh, black, powerful dragon king. And then uh, Ilo Ye Longwang, Elopatra, who is also means He Xiu Qi, peacefully cultivating auspiciousness, cultivating luckiness. All right, so that's one list. But there's another list. Eight Chinese dragon kings. Nanda, Upananda, Sagara, that's our king here. Vasuki, Takshaka, 
Anavatapta, Manasvin, and Utpalaka. So eight, another list of dragon kings. There's a Tibetan list of dragon kings that's different. There's a Hindu list of dragon kings that includes uh, Vasuki and Karkotaka, Padmavati, Dharma, Den Dharma Endra, Dharan Endra, uh, Takshaka, Arjuna, yeah. So uh, Kaliya and Matali, they are tied up in uh, Hindu literature, including the uh, uh, Ramayana, right? Um, so these dragons appear throughout the uh, traditional heritage learning of ancient cultures of the East and West. So interesting, what do I wanna do with that? Well, just keep my mind open, right? There's a lot to learn, there's a lot to learn here. And the stories are just amazing, totally amazing stories about these, these beings, right? Um, this gives me another perspective as I read the sutras. You could consider, I think the key word here is heritage. These are heritage stories. Uh, they've been around as long as human, humanity has been around. And uh, it gives us an opportunity to to um, expand the measure of our minds, right? And not be so sure that the things that I know is all there is to learn. Um, I'm, I have some photos that I didn't, some images that I didn't pass on. Here is an ancient image, uh, one of the oldest, earliest dragon images. Looks kind of like a horse, but it's not a horse, right? It's got horns on its head. It's got, like my friend here, right? Got horns and wings. Fly, here's another one. Check this one out. And the uh, Master Hua, I, I didn't bring your pearl. That's all right. Okay. Master Hua, um, when he transmitted the, uh, the Dharma pertaining to Guan Yin, gave us uh, the image of the wish-fulfilling pearl, the Rui Zhu. And one of the things he told us about dragons is that the, uh, the single item in the world that is most precious to a dragon is its pearl. Think of a, you know, a pearl and a pearl necklace, you know, a pearl ring, earrings. So pearls, dragons have pearls, and they are completely, completely uh, attached to their pearls. And to, uh, they, this is their, their power comes from them. And here is an image on my screen of a dragon focused on its pearl. And if it's a traditional image of a dragon, look for the pearl, you'll see it, okay? What is it about the pearl? Well, there was a, uh, a being told in the stories, uh, a, a being who was predicted to become a Buddha, because why? Because she is named Dragon Girl, Long Nu. She was willing to give up her pearl to the Buddha as an offering. And the Buddha said, you know, are you sure you want to give this up? She said, I value awakening. I value the Dharma more than my pearl, and I will willingly let go of the pearl. The Buddha said, ah, now this young woman has, is going to become a Buddha because she is nan shu, nan shu, right? able to let go of what's hard to let go of. So on my screen, I have an image of the stained glass windows at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And uh, our most talented and generous artist donor, Carolyn Hansen, uh, created these incredible dragon images at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Uh, four of them here. Here's the yellow dragon with the pearl. See the pearl? Urstor Bodhisattva. See the red dragon down below, right? Pursuing his pearl. 
here's another red dragon with this green pearl, right? These uh, are images from the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery's stained glass windows. So if anybody wants to see them, come visit the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Uh, here's a yellow dragon, powerful yellow dragon, with a deva, flying deva, and Manjushri Bodhisattva. Right? See the, uh, the pearl that this dragon is pursuing? The, the, the thing that I like about these stained glass dragons so much is they're both uh, intelligent and also wild. These are the way she's built them. As you can see, the, the, uh, the focus and the intensity of these dragon beings, but also you can see that they're untamed. Nobody, nobody, nobody tells this dragon what to do, right? Look at it. So powerful. So here's a green dragon with Guan Yin Bodhisattva and another red dragon. So we have dragons on both sides of the Buddha Hall and our beloved uh, carpenter builder, uh, He Tian, gave us dragons carved in wood on our Tripitaka case over the top. Whenever I'm the, 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 the ceremony master of the Ueno, at Berkeley Monastery, I always look at the look at the dragons carved into the altar into the wood. So there we are. That's uh, some of the lore of these amazing, amazing beings, right? So um, we have uh, our our tradition is chock full of stories of dragons. There's uh, every day at lunch, right? One of the the things that happens at a monastery is we uh, take some of the food that is being offered to the Sangha and in a ritual way, chanting just at lunch, we take seven grains of rice and go out and offer it to the ghosts, the spirits, and the dragons. And there's a great story that goes on that Master Hua shared with us. This is part of the absolute heritage lore of the monastery is that uh, there is a, another spiritual being called a da peng jin shi niao. It's a peng bird, it's called, it's a rock, R-O-C. Western mythology has it as the rock, R-O-C, rock. And uh, the peng bird eats dragons. And so uh, the Buddha, the story goes, the Buddha was in the world there are so many dragon stories that have to do with the Buddha's life, but we'll pick this one up. And uh, so the dragons were uh, subdued and tamed by the Buddha. They saw the Buddha, and these are spiritual beings of great power and scary as heck. You know? And so uh, we, we could ask my dragon friend to tell the story, but I'll save some time, I'll tell it for him. So, so uh, the dragons came to the Buddha and said, uh, you know, you've, uh, you've taken as your disciple this pung bird, this rock, and you know he eats us. And uh, if, you, if, if we're gonna be, we're natural enemies, and if you have him around, we're gonna disappear. That's just not fair, you know. So the Buddha said, oh, mm, got it, okay. Uh, he said, here's what you do. He said, he took his robe, he took his precept robe, he took threads from it. He says, here, hold one of these in your beak. And uh, he said, if you, if you hold this in your beak, he said, the pung bird, when the pung bird comes along and flaps its wings and all the water in the ocean washes away and the dragons are exposed and the pung bird goes down and slurps them up like noodles, you know, thump, thump, like that. You know? He said, if you hold this thread in your beak, when the pung bird flaps his wings and the water of the ocean goes away, he won't be able to see you and your lives will be saved and we'll have peace among the disciples. Right? So the dragons are like, oh me, oh, oh. you know. And so the Buddha gave them threads from the robe and they did that and the pung birds came flap, 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 oh, and they looked down and no dragons. Oh, of course, so the pung birds show up in front of the Buddha and they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. We understand that you gave these dragons a way to avoid being eaten by us. Well, that's great, good for you, but good for them, but you know what? We're hungry. 
unfair to pung birds. <laughs> pung birds, you know, support your local pung bird union. So the Buddha said, all right, all right, very well. He said, here's what you do. He said, I'm going to suggest a change of diet. He said, if you come to the monastery every day at noon, my disciples will give you something better than dragons to eat. We'll give you food that has been blessed by them. The light of the Buddha is on it. The whammy is on this food. It's really special nutrition for pung birds and dragons and ghosts and spirits alike. You will eat the Buddha's food. Are you happy? Sounds good to me, said the pung birds. You know. So that was how they worked it out. And that's why the monks every day, before monks and nuns, before we eat, we share food so that the da pung jin shi niao and all of the ghosts and spirits can come and be full with the Buddha's own food. So, the food of the three jewels. So that's how, you know, you need wholesome, flexible, mindful skill to be a Buddha, to teach. Living beings are hard to take across. You satisfy this one and they're unhappy. You satisfy that one and they're suffering. So, that's the story. I love that story because it's, it, just, it shows, you know, what a headache we are. <laughs> we plague the Buddha with our stuff, you know. So yeah, so the Buddha finds a way to keep the dragons alive and keep the pung birds alive and happy. So I thought um, it would be appropriate now to share something very wonderful. I just recently, I was raised, uh, my uh, generation, folk music came into being in my generation, uh, the folk music revival and uh, one of the uh, when I was really at that age as a teenager um, Peter Paul and Mary were my touchstone musical sounds this is how I heard folk music and uh, Peter Yarrow Mary Travers and Noel Paul Stuckey were my absolute favorites back then and I by listening to their music I was inspired to pick up a guitar so one of the uh, early songs that was a, a big hit was Puff the Magic Dragon and Peter Yarrow co-wrote it with another man and uh, there, there was a controversy even about it people assumed that Magic Dragon meant marijuana and this was a, a a covert way to encourage people to smoke dope and it was not it was not it was just puff you know it could have been could have been you know uh, could have been Bob the magic dragon and we would have avoided all the problems but anyway This song is a beloved song, and it's a kid's song, but it, when you look at it, one of the interesting things is that it's tragic. It's not a song about marijuana. It's a song about growing up and the, uh, the challenges of, that happens when we outgrow, uh, when the, the generational change happens. And there's a story about little Jackie Paper, who loved his favorite dragon, Puff, and how they used to play together and have a wonderful time. And then, a dragon lives forever, but not so little boys. Painted wings and giant's rings make way for other toys. Coming of age. One gray night it happened, Jackie Paper came no more. And Puff, that mighty dragon, he ceased his fearless roar. His head was bent in sorrow. Green scales fell like rain, right? Well, you know, it's tragic. You have all your green scales. You're fine. Well, because you sing a song. Okay. So, Puff no longer went to play along the cherry lane. Without his lifelong friend, Puff could not be brave. So Puff, that mighty dragon, sadly slipped into his cave. Right? So that's how the song went. And it's bittersweet, you know, and it kind of, there, it's given rise to lots of uh, um, 
explanation about how the song is there to provide children with childhood trauma to prevent them, to, to prepare them for the misery of growing old. You know, oh, oh my goodness. So this, there's been lots of uh, talk about Puff the Magic Dragon, but people love it. It's a wonderful song. Last week, I found the missing last verse of Puff the Magic Dragon, and I won't tell you until we get there. Brand new, the missing last verse has been discovered, and it uh, heals the, the pain. Ready? And yes, you can sing along. paper of that rascal puff and brought him string and sealing wax other fancy stuff oh puff the magic dragon did by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanley puff the magic dragon by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Together they would travel on a boat with billowed sail. Jackie kept a lookout perched on Puff's gigantic tail. Noble kings and princes would bow whene'er they came. Flags when Puff roared out his name. Oh, Puff the magic dragon in by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Puff the magic dragon in by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. forever, but not so little boys. Painted wings, giant's rings, make way for other toys. One gray night it happened, Jackie Paper came no more. And Puff, mighty dragon, he ceased his fearless roar. His head was bent in sorrow, green scales fell like rain. Puff no longer went to play along the cherry lane. Without his lifelong friend, Puff could not be brave. So Puff, that mighty dragon, sadly slipped into his cave. Oh, Puff, the magic dragon, lived by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist. In a land called Hanali, Puff the magic dragon lived by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist. In a land called Hanali, okay, ready? Puff the magic dragon flew out on the strand. He looked down, and there he saw footprints in the sand. A voice said, Mr. Dragon, please don't be so sad. <laughs> my name is Jenny Paper. I was sent here by my dad. Oh, together we can sing it. It's just a children's song. And if you do not know the words, you'd better learn them. Puff the magic dragon by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Puff the magic dragon by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Isn't that 
good. I love that last verse, right? He goes out, Puff is out there, you know, sad that little Jackie Paper has grown up. And uh, Jenny Paper says, don't be sad. My dad sent me to be your friend. So good for you, Jenny Paper. Okay, so that's our our Western contribution, our contemporary contribution to the lore of dragons. And uh, so here's our sutra telling us that just the way Sagara, the dragon king, is able to send down limitless heaps of rain, um, so too, you know, do bodhisattvas have capacity to hold all that rain. And we're going to pick up, pick up that story next week. Um, the analogy continues to the idiom. Now, um, as I say, I, I keep an open mind, and I'm, I was raised in a scientific, analytical, evidence-based context, like most of us, right? Prove it, is my, you know, science says prove it. Science says, show me. Hmm? Yet there's so much that science can't explain. One example, coronavirus. We don't know. We don't know what it's about. And yet, it's totally real. Right? So, uh, I was on the pilgrimage, uh, bowing with another monk, every three steps bowing to the ground and seeking for world peace, uh, as if, right? And the two of us reached Central California, a place where Vandenberg Air Force Base, or Santa Maria in the Mesa, near Pomo in that area. And Vandenberg Air Force Base was the home of the Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, SAC, Strategic Air Command, was located at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Vandenberg was tasked with keeping Los Angeles and San Francisco safe by having the presence of hot missiles there, ready to go. And uh, as we bowed, since we bowed so slowly, one mile a day, Anybody, any of the, the airmen or support staff, the Vandenberg Air Force Base, drove past us every day on their way to work. And they knew we were there. And we actually had visits from the base commander. <laughs> he was in civvies, in plain clothes, but he came out to check us out because see, this is a man who'd traveled all over the world and when he was in Asia, he'd learned about Buddhism. He was interested to see if we were what we pretended to be, right? what we purported to be. So um, a huge storm blew in. And uh, well, the preface of this was Master Hua, uh, who when we started our pilgrimage, told us that um, he said, uh, you may not fight. He says, under no circumstances are you two allowed to fight. He said, you have to find some way to solve any friction that comes up or problems other than fighting. And, and he looked at me and he said, your silence is the best thing you've got going. It's harder to argue when you're not talking, right? <laughs> I'm sure you'll find a way, but it's harder. So he said, really hold your silence vow and don't fight. He said, if you fight, the dragons won't protect you anymore. We're like, dragon shrivel? Never mind. He says, just don't fight. Okay, so dragons won't protect us if we fight. All right, so that's good to know, shrivel. You know. So we're bowing outside of Vandenberg Air Force Base, and a huge, huge storm blows in. This is a major three-day storm that occasionally hits the coast of California. And we knew something was up because we didn't see any cars coming down the road, including no, no donors, no, no food, lunch, you know. So we ate Ritz crackers and road greens. We, 
greens, you know, wild plants that we foraged for ourselves and rich crackers, these, you know, rich round stacks of rich crackers. That was lunch for three days. And then, finally, uh, a car of lay people pulls up on the fourth day, and uh, we're like, hi, what's going on? And they, they say, oh, you're here, you're here. We were so afraid that you had gotten blown off the highway, that you'd gotten washed into the ocean. We said, why? What's going on? The weather's fine. They said, the weather's fine here. You don't know? No, what, what, we, don't, we didn't hear anything. We just knew nobody was coming. She said, there's been a major, huge storm hit the coast of California. The highways were blocked. Highway 1, Highway 101 were blocked. That's why nobody came out. We couldn't. The storms were so bad that one of the command officers at Vandenberg in a jeep was blown off the road and killed. Right? Trucks, uh, 18-wheeler trucks were blown off the freeway. They had, they were, all the roads were, were flooded and, and closed. And we said, we had no idea. We didn't know. And uh, so it's like everything was fine here. It was calm. We were just bowing by ourselves on this eucalyptus studded highway. And uh, so, so Master Hua came by. And there was Shurfu. And he gets out of the car. He says, oh, he bought a Shurfu. He says, oh, he says, no troubles, right? Everything's okay, no problem. And uh, we said, yeah, Shurfu. He said, uh, did you see that donut in the sky? I'm like, he said, don't look. We're like, what? He says, you guys are sincere. He said, you better stay sincere. If you know that the dragons are there protecting you, keeping the storms away from you, you have to be even more sincere. We're like, sure, fool. He got in his car and drove away. <laughs> There's a blue sky over our heads. And we were apparently, while we were bowing for three days, something was keeping the rain off us. And so that Master Hua later said, he said, did you lose your donut in the sky? He said, did you fight? You know, we're like, what donut, sure? Never mind, don't, don't false think about it, he said. So, you know, what's that all about? No idea, no idea. But apparently, uh, it's, it doesn't do to, maybe this is a donut in the sky. Dragons with looking at their pearl. Who knows? Who knows? But that, uh, all we know is that it didn't rain on us for three days, and it rained everywhere else, and it killed the, one of the high-ranking officers, tipped his jeep over, and semi-trailers were flipped on the highway. So, in any case, the lesson of that is don't fight. And be sincere. So. All righty. Uh, let's see now. Um, we have talked about eight dragon kings. We've talked about uh, the images in the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. We've talked about Sagara, one of the main kings who is in charge of the rain, mentioned in the Avatamsaka, and uh, how the Bodhisattva's capacity to hold Dharma wisdom in the 10th stage is similar to the ocean, excuse me, which doesn't overflow its banks. So we will come back next week to get the, the rest of our idiom, uh, the rest of our analogy here to learn a little bit more. We'll be bringing back some more dragon dharma. There are story upon story upon story of how Buddhism, which is not given to fancy, right? I, if I can convey one pr perspective on the Buddhist teachings is this is not, these are not fairy tales. These are not, you know, the wrong use of the word myth, meaning made up. These are heritage stories from the dawn of humanity's wisdom carried on to the present. And we can take it as real as physics textbooks as the manual that tells you how to put together your Ikea furniture. That's the sutras, only that's a mundane example, right? The spiritual equivalent of Ikea furniture instructions. There you go, pin it down, right? 
These are blueprints for your own liberation. That's what they are. They're not fiction at all. And here they are talking about dragons. What a challenge to the modern mind. How do we make sense of that, right? So, I'll leave you there. Big shoes. Jin Chuan, Jin Jin Fu, Jin He, Jin Jin Wei Shi. Does anybody want to talk about my uh, the lecture coming up with the Vedanta, and tell us a little bit about the three day Amitabha? How did it go? Anybody listening in who can share that information? Maybe Jin Fu Shi, do you want to talk about the Amitabha session? I can find Reverend Hong Shir's photo. I mean, the poster. I need to go find it. You 参加八关斋戒有大概应该有两三百个然后每天每天这个参加人数也是差不多两三百个所以大家都蛮喜欢的因为我们第一次在线上做八关斋戒然后做三天的佛山虽然只有三天但是大家都非常踊跃大家都非常法喜所以我说这个有时候有的人建议以后我们要多做这样子对对对对都是上网的 yeah. <coughs> uh, Master Jin Fu says uh, We just finished at the Berkeley Monastery We just finished a three day online Amitabha recitation session And uh, we invited people to, each person who registered could put up two plaques, two pi weight, right? We had over a thousand registered. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, we printed them out and put them up. And the, uh, another kind of unique, maybe, I haven't heard of this other places, we offered the eightfold precepts as an option. People could take them on that first morning. And uh, 200 plus people took the Bhagwan idea, the eightfold precepts online before the, the first day. And then uh, we did hours of practice every day and we had up to 300 people join uh, worldwide. You know, it went, we had friends from China, we had friends from, from Taiwan, from Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, uh, and all over Europe and North America, Latin America, so quite, and Australia and New Zealand. So quite a, uh, an auspicious beginning. How funny how that, Okay, I have the poster. Can can it allow me for the share screen? Sure. Okay. May I allow? Okay. 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 So, Dharma Master Jin Chuan is now going to share something. The Vedanta Society of Berkeley has a lecture series called Living in Spirit. And uh, I'm going to be giving a talk this coming Sunday morning, next Sunday, the 19th. Uh, at 5.30 p.m. Let's see. Uh, is this correct? No, no. Is it yeah. my Monday? When does it work? It looks like yeah, your it's Monday. Monday. It's your Monday. Monday. It's, going to be... it's Sunday, 5.30 yeah. p.m. It's in Berkeley in North America. Uh, and in, in, yeah, so California time is 5.30 on Sunday afternoon. Australia time is um, 7, is that 7.30? It, Monday morning. It's early. So let me, let me double check here. I'll do it quick. I got my time buddy here. So 5.30 p.m. in California is, here we go. 5.30 p.m. is 10, 10.30, 10.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m. in uh, the Gold Coast. So it'll be an hour talk or so, maybe chance for some questions. The topic is Buddhistic perspective in this scenario <laughs> of new normal. <laughs> I'll go for it, you know. It's, uh, it'll be mostly talking about coping, ways, methods of coping with the, the, uh, the situation we find ourselves in worldwide. All right, so it's an online lecture hosted by our friends at the Vedanta Society of Berkeley. Swami uh, 
Prasanat Mananda is our, is our host. And uh, we have, at the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association, we have deep, long friendship ties with the, the uh, monks, the swamis of the Ramakrishna mission. So, okay, thank you, so, Antoine. Do you have any other information so to pass people, on? I think so people take a look at that Zoom link. Maybe, uh, your Dharma Master, maybe I can put this, this poster on the website, the front page of the BBM website. Okay. So if you want to find the information for this, you can just go to berkeleymonastery.org and you'll see there a, there'll be a, the first event will be this one and okay. you click the link if you want to join. Yeah, that's the deal is you can join by Zoom if you want yeah, to. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Uh, it's, it's a Monday morning, so if you're working here in the Gold Coast, that'll be a challenge. But uh, otherwise, uh, folks in California can have a Sunday night lecture. All righty. Thank you for that. Um, now, let us uh, transfer the merit. Uh, you'll notice on my desktop, right? What have I got on my desktop? That is a picture of the uh, Buddha Root Farm of years back. This, does anybody recognize what year that is? I think that's two years ago. Jin Chuan, your mom is there. <laughs> uh, there she is. Yeah, I think that's judging by... I believe that's two, yeah, Fabrizio, that's three years ago. That's, so that's 2018, 20, 2017. Um, how many friends joined us today on YouTube? And how many, how many in Asia? 56, 56 from the Chinese side. And I'm gonna bring up dedication of merit here. So we can all, oh, I know what I wanna do. We'll do a, um, we're going to do the Medicine Buddha Mantra. Uh, that has been helpful, I think. And uh, what we'll do with this is we'll let the mantra be our dedication. Okay? So, 152 on YouTube. So, 200 folks. The idea is the, to, to dedicate merit, what, what matters is what we do with our minds. The melody and the verse that we use to send it off is really optional. So let's use the Medicine Buddha mantra as our send-off verse, kind of the, the surrounding uh, verse that puts our voices together, our minds together. But the, the way we hui xiang, the way we transfer merit is up to us. So please make that wish. And because this, the power of this mantra is focused on the vows of the Buddha of healing, the healing Buddha, medicine Buddha. It gets an added boost that way. All right. So if you will, please uh, make a wish and send out the goodness from joining in, looking into the Flower Garland Sutra and uh, singing, as Dharma Master Hung Lai says, the... Uh, the songs of the bodhisattvas, right? The sutras as symphony. We tune our ears. So let's tune our hearts together and make a wish. We'll do it three times, and then we'll do three half bows, and we'll be done. Here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vaisajaguru Duriya Prabharajaya Patagataya Arhate Samyak Sambudaya Adyata Wow. Mm -hmm. 
my handbell and there you go got it and I'm going to make three bows here three half bows to the Buddhas and three half bows to our teacher Thank you for joining everybody. See you all next week. Omitofu.